be recorded, so I'm hitting record now. And also we have people from here in Milledgeville, across the state of Georgia, from DC to California, and based on the registrations, even as far away as Pakistan. <laughs> so if you wish, you know, while I'm giving this introduction, feel free to put uh, your, where you're from and your organization in the chat box during this introduction. So I also wanna acknowledge our Georgia College President, Dr. Dorman, our Provost, Dr. Spiro, uh, who I'll mention being in attendance today. And we also have several of what I call the, the OG, call me Mr. Individuals like Mr. Winston Holton, Mr. Mark Joseph, so on and so forth. So we appreciate y'all coming out to support us as part of the Call Me Mr. family. But before we get into exactly who our misters are and the panel discussion, I do want to say just a little bit about why we're here. My colleagues and my misters probably get tired of me mentioning, mentioning this, but James Baldwin gave a speech several decades ago entitled A Talk to Teachers that I recommend that everyone read. That's your homework for tonight. But one of the key quotes he says in that speech is, let's begin by saying that we are living through a very dangerous time. Everyone in this room is in one way or another aware of that. We are in a revolutionary situation, no matter how unpopular that word has become in this country. The society in which we live is desperately menaced, not by Khrushchev, but from within. To any citizen of this country who figures himself as responsible, and particularly those of you who deal with the minds and hearts of young people, you must be prepared to go for broke. Or to put it another way, you must understand that in the attempt to correct so many generations of bad faith and cruelty, when it is operating not only in the classroom, but in society, you will meet the most fantastic, the most brutal, and the most determined resistance. There is no point in pretending that this won't happen. No point in pretending that this won't happen. That was James Baldwin 50 years ago. And yet, here we are in 2021. Like Baldwin, I am not a teacher myself, but I don't think I'm overstepping my bounds to suggest that we are still very much in that revolu revolutionary system situation right now. There is no point in pretending that this won't happen. So of course, this is Black History Month. And it's important to ground this discussion within the heritage, within the history, and within the, this great tradition that these young men are upholding today. So once upon a time, we had a much higher percentage of black teachers, but one of the adverse effects of Brown versus Board of Education was that while yes, it desegregated the classroom, but it also led to black teachers being pushed out of the profession, largely because white families didn't want their children being taught by people who look like me, or there are these misters. So what are you gonna do in that case if you can't teach in the newly integrated schools, the newly integrated white schools, and then of course, the black schools are closing down. You need to find new avenues of employment. And so 50 years later, we are still, still reeling from that dynamic. Black men account for just 2% of the nation's public school teachers, 2%. Studies have come out over the last few years asserting the fact that just one, one black teacher in elementary school increases the chances of a low income black student to graduate high school. And for poor black boys, the number, they are actually 40% less likely to drop out of high school. 40% just by having one black teacher, one additional black teacher. So enter Call Me Mister. This program began 20 years ago at Clemson University because Dr. Roy Jones and others knew. They knew even back then, way before it was trendy to talk about these things that the impact of black teachers could not only have on black students, but all students. So now the program has spread to over 30 different institutions, both within South Carolina and nationwide. Ours is the first in Georgia, established in 2014 at Georgia College in Milledgeville here. But I'm pleased to note that we are also joined now by Kennesaw State, who's starting a brand new Call Me Mr. program as well. So shout out to Dr. Glenn at KSU. We look forward to collaborating with y'all in some way in the very, very near future. So about our misters though, I am extremely proud of these young men. I won't embarrass them too much, but several of them I've known since they were in high school. Um, I've met and kept up with their parents and their families. Now this isn't the entire group of course, but we have a pretty good representation of Call Me Mister, both of our alumni currently teaching and also a couple of those currently on their journey towards teacher certification. So I told them to be honest as possible 
And these experiences that they may share today are things that have often been shared in our seminars with each other already, either with me or other mentors. Because again, this is Black History Month, right? And I tell these guys all the time that they are living Black history. Their narratives are important and they are different from each other. And their stories are experiences that we as educators need to hear and we need to reflect upon. So this is a chance for you to hear them and reflect as well. I'm sure some of you may have questions, but I ask that you save them for the Q&A at the end of the panel. So what we're gonna do is start this panel, this discussion by allowing our misters to first introduce themselves. So, so all of my misters here, introduce yourself, tell us exactly who you are, where you're from, and most importantly, perhaps, exactly how you're doing. And remember to unmute yourself as well. Starting with Mr. Jones. Good afternoon to everyone. I hope all are as well with everyone. My name is Mr. Homer Jones. I am a graduate of Georgia College of State University in Millersville, Georgia um, for 2019. I am currently in Macon, Georgia. I teach at the Applin Middle School. I teach seventh grade science. Um, and I'm actually a native of Macon as well. So I'm from Macon, Georgia as well. And I'm doing great today. So I'm good. Thank you. Mr. Davis. Afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Seben Davis. Um, I'm a 2019 graduate of Georgia College of State University. Um, last year, I taught as a fifth grade special education teacher in Jones County. Um, I just currently received my master's in uh, school psychology from Georgia Southern, and I'm continuing in that program um, towards my specialist. All right, Mr. Cooper. Let's see, you have, might have to unmute yourself. Hey, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Mr. Cooper. I'm a 2020 graduate of Georgia College middle grades. Um, and I'm currently in the MED program studying instructional technology at Georgia College. And I'm teaching in Warner Robins and I'm also from Warner Robins. And don't forget to tell us how you're doing. How I'm doing good, good. All yes, right. sir. Mr. Wooten. Good evening, everyone. My name is Michael Wooten. I am currently in the graduate program at Georgia College of State University, getting my uh, MAT degree. Um, I am from a very small town called Great Georgia. Um, it's about 11 miles outside of Macon, Georgia. Most people don't know it. You'll pass right through it if you just blink your eye. Um, <laughs> and I am actually doing very well today. And Mr. Brown. Hello, my name is Mr. Brown. I am a graduate of Georgia College and State University, um, 2000, class of 2018. Um, I teach at Wilkinson County High School and I'm from Augusta, Georgia, and I am doing great today. All right, all right. So that's our panel of misters for today. As you can see, uh, they're you know, a great diverse group of individuals. So- Wait. Go ahead. Well, hold on. I'm I'm on here too. Who who is that? Jason Berkeley. Yes. Introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Hi, right, how you doing? My name is Jason Berkeley from Brooklyn, New York. I graduate of Morehouse College. I'm a graduate of Georgia State, and I'm now I'm going to be a graduate of Clark Atlanta, second masters, MAT, secondary mathematics. Looking forward to get take my GACE exam hopefully in the beginning of March, graduate in this May. And I was invited from Dr. Mayfield, a wonderful, 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 powerful lady. And um, who's, who was also an AKA. And, um, you know, if it wasn't for, well, if it wasn't for God and wasn't for her, I wouldn't be here right now. Awesome, thank you for sharing that. And I- What year, did you, what year did you graduate Morehouse? I'm also a Morehouse grad, 2015. Oh, I'm, woo, got you about 15 years. I'm class of 2000. Ah. Awesome, awesome. I love that. I love that. And I'm, Mr. Berkeley, I'm glad you mentioned that too because uh, Dr. Felicia Mayfield is from Clark, Atlanta. She's someone who we've been collaborating and communicating with for several years. So shout out yeah. to Dr. Mayfield. We see you. We see you. And we hope to hear from you maybe during the Q&A portion. So 
as we officially begin the panel, you know, I, I definitely want to remind everybody to keep yourselves muted and for our misters to unmute themselves when they begin to talk, all right? So um, the initial question that I have for all of y'all is, we know black men are severely underrepresented in the teaching field. That's a fact that has been going around for the last you know, several years in terms of being in the spotlight, right? But yet you're here. So why exactly did you decide to teach? Well, I can answer that. Can I? Yeah, well, let's, let's, let's hear from our misters first though, okay? Okay, Jason, is that all, all right? right. All right. Thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and start. Um, again, this is also a disclaimer. This is my first year teaching. Um, the reason why I went into the field of education, I've always wanted to go into education ever since I was little. Um, yes, my mom was a teacher um, growing up, but I went into it specifically middle grades is because the quote that I have in, in my classroom is be who you needed when you were younger. So basically, um, I never had a black male educator growing up. Um, you know, I've always had white male coaches maybe here and there, but never a black male educator. One time I had a principal in high school and that was it. So I never really saw a black male educator in my life until I got to college. Actually, Dr. Little was my professor, I think my first year at Georgia College, which was my first black male educator. So it wasn't until I got to college around 18 or 19 years old that I had a black male educator. And I realized how impactful that can be for young adolescents, um, specifically in middle, middle school, just so they can see someone who looks like them and just someone they can relate to, as well as it's impactful to students who are not black as well to have that black male educator. So, I went into the field of education just to being that role model, that instructional leader that I never had in school growing up. And I think that was the main reason um, going into education, just being that person that I didn't really have growing up. I appreciate that. Any, any other misters? Thank you, Will. Yes, I, um, I, I like to go next. Go ahead, Stephen. Um, I decided to go into education, uh, specific, specifically special education, because I felt that that's where I can make the biggest impact. Um, I know that there are a lot of students who slip between the cracks and they don't really um, have that, that teacher who cares enough um, to go above and beyond and make the necessary sacrifices um, to get them where they need, need to be. Um, and I think back to teachers who helped me um, when I was a struggling student and how they were willing to put in that time to help me. So I feel that um, I can give back <clears throat> and be with those teachers work for me to help those students to get where I've been able to transition to because of the sacrifices that my past teachers were willing to make for me. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Mr. Jones, you had something? Yeah. Okay. So um, the reason why I became a teacher um, was for one very specific reason, and that would be self-worth. Um, a lot of times when I was in school, I felt like, you know, my voice did not matter. A lot of times, um, oftentimes I felt like I was like the oddball out the group. Um, but I knew I had a natural ability for helping people. Um, and one great way for me to do that is to teach. Um, I love what I do. Um, this is also my first year teaching as well, officially. Um, I did a lot of student teaching and a lot of um, just practicing inside the classroom, but officially being inside of the classroom is definitely been exciting for me. Um, and I tell my kids every day, as long as you try, you're never alone. Um, and I express to them that no matter what they go through, despite this pandemic that we're all facing and going through and the challenges behind it, they still have support. And I express to my kids, no matter what, I'm gonna always be there. They can call me anytime. It doesn't matter when, what it's about, you know. Um, I just want them to feel like they have self-worth and that they matter because I didn't get that until I got into like high school. So for elementary school and middle school, I was still trying to find my way and I didn't have many teachers to help me do that. So now I want to help my kids and pave the way so that they can feel like, hey, I can do this. This is where I belong and now just watching them grow is amazing. And I'll piggyback a little bit on uh, what Mr. Homer was stating um, about seeing them grow. 
Um, that's one of the main reasons. Um, I, my mother was a paraprofessional for about 15 years. Now she's a parent mentor in our county. Um, I specifically went into special education. Again, also, I would like to know this is my first year. I was a parent for five years, and then now this is my actual first year actually being a teacher, a uh, special ed teacher. Um, I went in specifically into uh, special ed because, number one, I have an, uh, a brother that is special needs. Um, so it was a pretty much a passion driving, kind of a driving force, specifically self-contained at that. Um, and as people always tell me, you have to have a special heart for it, but I also grew up with it. So um, being able just to see the joy on kids' faces when they get something, being able to see that, oh, wow, that makes sense to me now because you broke it down and was able to do it this way to the smallest degree that now I'm able to get it. It brings joy to me. It's a passion of mine. It's something that I, I wake up every morning and every time I put my, my shoes, I'm like, okay, I'm going to see my kids. This one, this one, this one may be acting like this, but guess what? I know how I'm going to tackle that aspect or that aspect. It's just something that you you breathe, you 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 sleep about, you think about all the time. Um, it's funny because my I was at my parents' house a, a couple weekends ago, and they were telling me they were like, "You were teaching your class in your sleep." I was like, "When you when that's all you do, <laughs> it's something that's just natural to you. So even while you're sleeping, you're doing it." But yes, I do it because it's a passion of mine. Thank you for that, Mr. Wooten. Um, you know, and that's something we talk about a lot in Call Me Mister is that, that sense of it being a passion, a, a calling for you to teach. So I, I appreciate y'all's answers on that. So next, um, we talk a lot, a lot about um, the dichotomy of being both hyper visible and yet in some ways invisible as, as black people in a predominantly white uni in a predominantly white educational space, whether that's at a university or in the K-12 classrooms. Uh, some might say we spend a little too much time talking about that. <laughs> so how are you navigating that dynamic, whether that's as a pre-service teacher or an in-service teacher? Um, I will uh, kind of start this. I, I will say it's really hard. Um, and the reason I say it's really hard is because, first of all, let me give y'all a visual of kind of what my aspect is. I am the only male on my team in my pod. <laughs> number one, then I'm the only black male. <laughs> and then in my school, there's only three black males in my entire school. Of the entire school of the compass of how many black people in that teach in the actual school is six in total. So that just gives you, but I do teach in Gwinnett County. That just gives you a scope of my school. Um, there are a lot of male presence in my school, but a lot of them are coaches and different things of that nature. So they teach like PE and weightlifting and things of that nature. It's not too many that are in the actual classroom physically with the students. They coach them, but they don't always get the aspect of actually teaching them what uh, the different lessons and things of that nature. But I will say me as a black male being a teacher and feeling like I have to somewhat turn on different different dynamics when I'm with different people. It's almost like we call it a switch code. When you're with your friends, you say one thing. When you're with this person, you say this thing. When you're with this person, you say that thing. And you almost all don't want to be offensive because you'd be called threatening. I've already been called threatening once this year. So it's one of those things that you know you kind of back off. And it was from a white white teacher, white female teacher at that. So you know you and I'm a, the younger one in the group. So and brand new to the school. So, you know, you got to back off then because you don't want to seem like you're that black man. So <laughs> it's one of those things that it's a thin line between trying to not to go insane because you are holding so much in, but also trying to express yourself outwardly and still be professional. Thank you for that, Mr. Wooten. Um, we could we could go into a, a whole other rabbit hole there, but I do want to allow some of the rest of the misters to to give their input on that question. Um, I'll go next. So for me, um, when I was at Georgia College, um, a lot of what uh, Mr. Michael is talking about, like I felt the same way. Um, and being in Macon now and being like um, a native of Macon, 
I'm at a school now where it is predominantly black. Okay, um, most of the teachers are black women. Um, the administration is nothing but black women, and it's very few male black males as educators. Most of the black males are coaches. Um, but even for me, it's different because most of them went to an HBCU. Most of them went to Fort Valley. Um, so for me coming in, they a lot of them knew each other. It was like family. So I came in as an outsider. Um, also being one of the youngest people in the school. Um, and I kind of tried to gravitate towards those who I knew would be a support for me. Um, and a lot of times it's based off of, okay, who do you know? What are you teaching? And where can you go from there? Um, for me, I had a lot of ideas coming into the classroom. You know, I had a vision for myself, for my students, and it kind of got shut down at the beginning of the school year because I had a teacher tell me, they was like, I don't know what school you think you at, but them kids ain't gonna do that. <laughs> um, and I'm like, okay, so let me find a different route to go. And it's exciting for me because despite the teachers who told me that the students cannot do something, I made it possible for these students to do, you know, and I expressed to my students, I'm gonna motivate you, I'm gonna challenge you, you're gonna like me, you're not gonna like me, that's cool. But I'm going to motivate you and challenge you because I know what's out there in the real world. I know what it can do. And if you don't try now, and if nobody's telling you real life stuff now, there's no way you're gonna survive on your own. Um, and I read a poem to my kids every day called Our Deepest Fear. And that poem has stuck with me for years simply because our deepest fear is ourselves. Our deepest fear is that we're afraid of what we can really do. Each and every day, you know, I tell my kids, I'm, you know, I'd be exhausted teaching online, trying to teach in person and trying to do everything that needs to be done behind the scenes, all the paperwork. But at the end of the day, I let my kids know I have no excuses. That's my motto. I also coach, I coach cheerleading. Um, and my motto for the cheerleaders, there's no excuse. I can't live my life with excuses. And no one should feel like they have to make an excuse for maybe something they get done on time. Don't make an excuse about it, just be honest. I tell my kids all the time, if you don't know something, just say you don't know. Don't try to make up an answer or make it sound educated and creative because that, that's not gonna get you nowhere. But if you tell me you don't know, and then I come to you and I'm like, okay, let's talk about it. Then you give me the information I need. So now we can have that discussion, that dialogue. Now you're at the point where, okay, I can think about it. I feel accomplished. Not so much of, oh, I don't know and I'm not gonna answer or I just don't care about it. But giving them that opportunity to talk, like that's the biggest part. I don't want them to come in my classroom and sit there and look at me. I want y'all to talk to each other, talk to me, have that discussion because we don't, in education, there's not enough time for us to have those discussions. A lot of teachers feel like, oh, come in my class, sit down, be quiet, and we're gonna do work. No, in my classroom, we're gonna stand up, we're gonna have fun, we're gonna move around, throw paper balls across the classroom. I mean, we're gonna have some fun, but we're gonna talk about it. Because if we talk about it, then that gives everyone the opportunity to feel like I matter, I care, I can communicate. A lot of students, of my students, they don't know how to communicate. Why? Because they never had the chance to communicate or to even try. So that's just my philosophy behind that. Thank you, Mr. Jones, for that. And any other ministers want to chime in in the panel before we move on to the next question? You said a mouthful right there. <laughs> All right. Um, so this is kind of actually in, in relation to the previous question. Uh, as you know, in, in Mr., we don't beat around the bush. We get right to the nitty gritty. <laughs> and so um, we are in this moment of extreme turmoil in our nation due to the combination of white supremacist politics and, of course, a pandemic that still rages on. So how are you handling juggling all these things as an educator? Um, I'll say um, in regards to the pandemic portion of that question, I am thriving. Like this is, I, I feel like technology-based education is a, is a way that we are moving um, in America. Um, the kids, they, they love it. They, they love Zooming with me and communicating with me. And I, I've seen kids that have been in person um, last, last year before COVID hit, 
and they were the quietest, most silent kids. But now on Zoom, when I can put them in a breakout room by themselves, they're talking to me, they're telling me about their day, they're telling me everything. Like it is amazing. Like I I love this technology based. I, I feel more connected to my kids than I would if they were in person because I feel like I am seeing them. I'm seeing their faces. They're talking to me. Um, it's is a it's a it's very it's a very personal um, thing to zoom with somebody when you're looking directly into their eyes and you know you see them. So um, I think that that this technology um, technology can be a wonderful thing, and we need to use it to the best of our abilities as teachers. Um, so I, I really enjoy this. Um, this Zooming new norm. Mr. Brown, I, I appreciate that. I, I'm not going to embarrass you too much, but for those of y'all who don't know Mr. Jerome Brown, he's someone who is known for smiling all the time. And so I'm, I was really happy to see him smiling when he's talking about how passionate he is with these with these students over there at Wilkinson County. So I appreciate that because that's not a perspective that we, we often hear when it comes to how things are going in the pandemic. So you're going to have to make sure you, you share that knowledge with some other people as well, OK? Yes, please share it with us because uh, <laughs> my experience right now, I guess because I also work with autism kids, they already don't like looking at you. So it's one of those things that they look away. But I also in Gwinnett County, we do, we get, they gave them the choice of in-person and Zoom. So I'm doing two things at one time. I'm putting out fires <laughs> in my classroom with behavior kids while also trying to teach on Zoom. So been very, very interesting. Um, and to just um, kind of talk about the turmoil that's um, in America. In the beginning when everything was happening, you know, it was one of those things that you would come home and you're like, everything that's going on, that could have been me. Like, if I was in this situation, that could have been me. Like, all those different things, and it, it weighed heavy on you, even though it was not necessarily you, it still weighed heavy on you what you also have still had to carry with you throughout going and still being in front of these different people that if we want to talk about the different stuff in politics and all that different type of thing, you know, and the different things that been, have been said when certain things were done. Well, if he was, uh, if he would have did this, then it, he, uh, then it would have been this way. But I, I always tell them, you don't know what it's like to be a black man in America. You don't know what it's like to actually be raised at five, five and up, being taught how to handle a police, how to how to deal with a police, how to say yes or no, so where to put your hands, all these different things, don't reach for nothing, all these different things that you are taught when you were younger. And then when as you're growing up and starting to drive, you know, all these different things that are happening when you drive. I've got pulled over several times. I'm, like again, I'm from a very small town, Gray, Georgia. 71% white. I have been called boy. I have been called the N-word. I have been patted down. I've been, and I'm a good child. <laughs> I wanted the good one. So just I can just imagine what they did to the ones that are not. Um, and so those different things kind of get replayed when you have all these different things that are going on in America and all these different things that are now on video that we can physically see. A lot of people don't want to talk about it because, again, it's something that they get nervous about. It's something that, well, why do we have to put race in it? Well, if it, if it wasn't just, if it was other races that were getting it done to, we wouldn't have to put race in it. Black people have been suppressed since they got here in America. America has never been made for Black people. <laughs> it was made for uh, the other, the white, the white race. <laughs> and we're just here. And we built it for them. And we're just here just to, to help them out. And so some are still in, very entitled in that aspect and feel that way. Um, but we have kind of somewhat uh, moved forward. But I feel like sometimes we take 10 steps forward and take 100 steps back with certain things. <laughs> I mean, we're now just talking about we got our first ever 49 vice presidents. We got our first ever woman president. 40, what, 40, 
40, what, 44 presidents. We got our first black president. Like, why is that? Why? In, in America, land of the free, home of the brave. We the people, as we say, <laughs> created equally. And we have these still these different things that are going on. But I digress. Let other people talk. <laughs> Uh, I appreciate that. You know, this is this is for those of y'all who are uninitiated. This is this is how we do in our leadership seminars. We 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 get the issues out there. Sometimes it's an hour. Sometimes it's two or three. It just depends because it's important to provide a safe space uh, for these young men to talk about these issues because you may not have that space in the classes that you go into, uh, whether that's K twelve or otherwise. So this is this is important conversation. Um, before we move on to another question, do any of the, his fellow misters yeah. want to add to that? Yes. Um, so again, it's my first year teaching. Um, as far as the pandemic side, I think I would agree, agree a lot with Mr. Brown. Um, this pandemic, so in college, I took a class. It was an instructional technology class. It was an online teaching class we all had to take. And in the back of my mind, I, was, I thought like, when am I really ever going to use this? Um, when am I ever gonna use teach online? But now, I guess since March, teachers have had to move online and move their teaching practices to online. And so the thing at my school, a lot of the first year teachers were able to use a lot of what we learned in our undergrad programs and a lot what we know about with technology to reach our students, our young adolescents. And I agree with Mr. Brown, like those quiet kids you get to see come to life on whether it's over the computer, face to face. So I really enjoy that part. Um, right now I'm studying instructional technology for my MED program. So I'm able to kind of experiment what I'm learning in grad school and use it for the students and meet their needs. So I think that's been really, really awesome because we're moving to technology. Teachers are moving to different ways to teach students. So I think that's an amazing thing there, um, even though it's kind of difficult at times, but it's just awesome to see students excited about using technology in school and not just using it just to play like a Kahoot game or something, but actually enhance their learning. So I'm learning from the students. They're learning from me. And I think as far as the term oil, um, what I focus on with my students, I teach middle school. So what, 11 to 13. This year, we focused a lot on SEL, which is social, social emotional learning with our kids. So every day we do have conversations like a first five minutes we watch CNN 10. So of course we'll discuss whatever CNN 10 is talking about that day. But I kind of let them lead the discussion where if they bring up injustice or anything, they'll lead the discussion and they'll also get to journal about it too. And we'll talk about it that way. So if it comes up in discussion, of course, we'll have discourse over it, but it's a way for them to get their, um, their feelings out because a lot of we just got students back from this in January from March so they've been out of school what 10 months now so much has happened since then so it's so important of course teaching the content the content will come that this school year a lot of us has focused on social emotional learning just being there for our students and just encouraging them and just whatever they need to talk about making sure that they're okay first and then you know teaching the content so yeah, those conversations do come up, but it's just a way that I allow the students to kind of lead those conversations and then we'll, you know, go from content from there. So that's been the midst of the pandemic so far. Thank you, Mr. Cooper, for that. Uh, that that's, you know, I think this is really important in the context of this discussion because so often when we're talking about Black male teachers, the emphasis is solely on representation and, and diversity, but um, you still have to be able to do the work. You still have to be a, a good teacher. And so that's why teacher efficacy is one of the key tenets of Call Me Mister that we talk about quite often. And so next question kind of gets at that. So particularly for those of y'all who are teaching right now in some capacity, what has been your biggest challenge as a teacher? And conversely, what do you feel like has been your biggest triumph? Um, I can definitely answer that first. Um, so the biggest challenge for me, um, is engagement and motivating my students. But not only has that been the biggest challenge, it's also been my biggest triumph. Um, 
at the beginning being virtual, um, at Bibb County, what we did was we went from virtual to what they call a high flex model of teaching, where we're teaching half of our kids and then we're also doing kids online. Um, and that within itself, for me as a first year teacher has been overwhelming, but it is also rewarding because I have had students, you know, um, that a lot of the teachers, they'll talk about the students and be like, well, this student, you know, for example, Lil John John. So Lil John John, you know, we had him last year. He didn't do this, he didn't do that. But then all I had to do was just talk to him. Um, and the biggest thing I talk about in my classroom is we're building relationships. And that that's all it is. I'm building a relationship with my students because I want them to know that I care. I can't just teach them and then expect them to do my work. One thing I've learned about myself and my students, if they don't like you, they're not gonna do your work. They're not gonna do nothing if they don't like you. So it's not even just about liking you, it's about respect. My students respect me just like I respect them. And how do I do that? I ask them every day, how was connection? How are you doing today? Do you need anything? Is your technology working today? These are things that, simple things that make the biggest difference. My kids participate in my class. Even though when we're online, it is a struggle to get my kids to put something in the chat or to come off the mic and say something. But when they do, they are so engaged. And I, I ask myself all the time, I'm like, okay, why is it that my kids are doing work in my class, but not someone else's class? What, what am I doing? And I keep thinking about, it, I'm like, okay, let, let me try something new. And every day I'm working on building those relationships. I'm talking to the students. I call the students. I had several children this morning who didn't show up for supervision. I called them on the phone. I FaceTimed them. Hey, what you doing? Like, what's up? They was like, Mr. Jones, I just woke up. I'm coming to your class. I said, well, come on, class started at 9 o'clock and 9.15. You're going to be more absent. What's up? Let, let's go. You know, that's the type of person that I am, and that's how much I care. And then for my kids to tell me, they was like, Mr. Jones, we never had a teacher like you. I said, I know. And you ain't going to find another one like me. I know. I said, I'm crazy. It's okay. You know, and I'm honest with them and I'm open with them about that because they need that. They, my kids have told me up front, um, Mr. John, we don't want to talk about that. We talk about that every year. We done talking about that. I said, okay, so let, let's, let's change the game then. I give them real world examples about things. I share my personal life, different aspects with them because they need to hear it. They need to understand that they are not alone. Some of them go through things that they feel like, oh, I'm just by myself. No one understands. And there's so many of us out there that understand exactly what they're going through. But because we don't take the time to listen or the time to talk to them or build those relationships with them, we will never know. There are kids in my class now, I asked them to write an essay for science. I said, look, just write an essay for science. Some of them blew it out the waters. But if you ask them in English to go write an essay, they was like, how you get them to write that? I said, they did it on their own. They was like, how you get them to do that? I said, did you talk to them and ask them how they're doing today? They said, no. I said, that's why. Like, it's just that simple. If my kids are not in a stable mindset, nine times out of 10, I can't reach them if they're not in a mindset where they want to learn. So I asked them, how y'all feeling today? Is this a day where we need to have a kumbaya moment? Or can I teach today? What, what, what y'all need? Some days we just sit and talk, talk about how they feel. Where are they mentally during this pandemic? Because some of them, as my school would say, are on different levels. If you're on level one, you're not that affected by the pandemic. But maybe you're on level five where you're 100% affected by the pandemic. And that means a lot. Some kids can't function because they're not even at home. They're taking care of their grandparents or they're babysitting their brothers and sisters. So instead of me fussing at them about, oh, you didn't come to class today. I tell my kids all the time, look, if you got stuff going on at home, and you're not able to come to class, shoot me an email, text me. Let's talk about it. What can I do for you? And it makes a difference. And I'm just amazed on how from a short amount of time, it took me maybe three months at the beginning of the school year to get my kids to the point where they trust me and that they are willing to communicate with me. I have kids now, they communicate with me. They'll call me early in the morning, Mr. John. Okay, you said class started at nine o'clock. What are we doing in class today? I'm like, wait a minute, look. Class ain't started. I'm trying to get my life together. Like, hold on, you know, but that makes them excited. I'm excited for them, you know, and again, they're living by what I tell them, you know, no excuses. 
I have kids now. They don't make an excuse for nothing no more. I can ask a kid right now, hey, you remember what we did yesterday? They're going to be like, uh-uh, but I'm going to try. And that's what it's about. It's about trying because they, you never know what you can do until you try. And I don't want to fail any of my students because I didn't try. And during this pandemic taught me a lot, not just about technology, but about the students, about teachers. Despite what, te what we as teachers go through, and again, I am a teacher, I coach, I dance outside of school, I do so much, but again, I don't make an excuse on why I cannot do something. And I don't make an excuse on why my students cannot do something. I brag on them all the time. And I tell people, all it takes is just a little bit of conversation a little bit of motivation. And for me, I still struggle with motivating a lot of my students because some of them, they, they just put up this wall. They have this wall like, you know what? I don't care what you say, you just don't care, you know? But again, I'm breaking those walls down with my students. And it gets to the point in my classes, I have three jobs every day in my class. One of them is gonna be the moderator. They're gonna look in the chat and tell me what's going on. Can they see my screen when I share my screen? I have a sergeant at arms. Those be my people with the attitudes that's going to be like, look, your microphone off mute, put it on mute, let's go. And then I have my timekeeper. These are the people who love to be on their cell phones and they're going to keep the time. They're going to be like, look, Mr. Jones, you got three minutes left. What we doing? Let's go. But they are excited to do it. They come in class, Mr. John, can I be the timekeeper? Can I be the moderator? I'm like, look, if you want it, you got it. Let's get it. I ain't in, you ain't getting volatile, you're volunteering. And that's when I know I am successful when my kids begin to volunteer and not be voluntold. And a lot of times they've been voluntold their whole life that they feel like at this point, I just don't care. So instead of them being voluntold to do something, I let them volunteer. Anybody want to do this today? If you don't, it's okay. And we keep it moving. So that's just my philosophy about what's going on right now. So. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Uh, Trying not to tear up here. I've no, haven't known you since you were very, very young, and seeing that enthusiasm, it's just great to see you put it actually into practice. Because we've talked about this for years, um, so that's that's amazing. Um, can I can I say something? Who's that? Berkeley, Jason Berkeley. Really quickly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Mr. Jones, he hit it one thousand percent on the nose. That is my philosophy and my teaching right now, especially coming from Brooklyn, New York. You have to respect these kids first in order for, you, for them to respect you. If you can't respect them, you ain't going to be able to do anything. They got to like you. If they don't like you, it's a done deal. It's not happening. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, these kids are young adults now and got many different situations going on. And it's just what it, he, he I, I could not say that any better. Kudos to him. I couldn't say that any better. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think, Mr. Cooper, did you have something you wanted to add before we move to the next question? Uh, Yes, Mr. Jones, I took some notes for you. So when I can do when I do my Zoom class, I'll have a timekeeper, sergeant at arms, and a moderator. So I took some notes from you on that. So, and I just think my biggest challenge so far. Can y'all hear me? The volume's a little low. We can we can hear you a little bit, but uh, you may have to put it in the chat. You may have to put it in the chat. Um, but yeah, we we appreciate that, Mr. Mr. Cooper and Mr. Jones. Like this, you know, this is what this is about. Uh, it's not only about sharing your 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 experiences as black male teachers, but also sharing some tools for because we have so many other educators on this call, uh, so many administrators as well. So I'm hoping that people can leave this Zoom with some tangible tools to take back to their schools and school systems as well. Um, you know, one of the things we talk about in Call Me Mister so often is this notion of being a, education being a calling. Uh, it's not something that you do, it's something that you were called to do. Um, and so have either of you had a moment that made you question that calling as an educator? And if so, how did you handle that moment? No, that's a tough question. <laughs> I guess. My, my call, um, my calling, I know what my calling was education, but that, that thing that made me doubt it was my undergrad year um, at Georgia College um, and being kicked out the cohort and told that uh, the way that you teach isn't, isn't good and 
but then becoming a teacher and hearing the exact opposite is like what were, what what was i what was i doing in college like what 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 was what was so bad um but i realized that a lot of things that happen in your undergrad year are about the books and what statistics say and what what data says about about teaching and all of that stuff is great but data does not teach kids um, facts do not teach kids teachers teach kids and if you are a good teacher if you care about your students if you if you put forth 100 percent effort into making sure that your kids have the best education that they can possibly have that is what makes you a good teacher. Um, so I think that having that, just being in, in my own classroom and having full autonomy to do whatever I want um, and learning and failing and growing from my mistakes, that is what has solidified my place um, and what, what I think is a great teacher. Thank you for that, Mr. Brown. Maybe one more before we move on to the next question. We might have to do a part two, y'all, because <laughs> there are so many other questions we're not going to have a chance to get to. Um, but I, I appreciate how thorough and, and in-depth these responses have been. This is amazing. Thank you. One more, Mr. Anytime that you've had an experience that made you question your calling as a teacher, whether it's an undergrad, grad school, or, or maybe it was in the classroom, or even before you got to all that. Um, I'll add to it. Um, just like Mr. Brown, um, in undergrad, there were so many things that I did um, when I was also in the cohort. Um, and it questioned, you know, I, I questioned myself a lot um, about was education for me? Um, and despite everything that happened and despite the decision that I made to change my path, right? I was headstrong on, okay, I'm going to do middle grades education. I'm going to join George College cohort. I'm going to graduate. I'm going to go teach. And when life hits you, you have no choice, but if, you, if that's your calling, you have no choice but to change a pathway. And um, for a while, people were telling me, well, you need to do this, that, and the third. And I finally got to the point where I was like, you know what? I don't have to follow the pathway people think I should go on. Um, I'm going to change my own pathway. I'm going to create my own destiny. I'm going to create my own vision and I'm just going to rock and roll with it. And that's exactly what I did, you know? Um, and being inside the classroom, what solidified my calling, um, I've had three students and these three students have touched my heart in so many ways and they're all in different classes, but these three students, you know, in the school building, people know them, you know, these are students who people have said, oh, they didn't do nothing but cuss me out last year. They didn't do this and they don't do no work and yada, yada, yada. But for me, it, it's refreshing when your students on Fridays, um, I tell my students, look, on Fridays, we're gonna sit down, let's celebrate. On Friday, every Friday we celebrate. And I say, hey, give me some shout outs. Give me what you're thankful for. It can be anything. What are you thankful for? What are your shout outs? It can be to your parents, your friends, to the classroom, to whoever. And the cool part about it is these students, they was like, well, shout out to you, Mr. Jones. I said, what y'all give me a shout out for? I ain't do nothing. Um, and they were so open with me about what, what I have done for them. One girl told me, she was like, Mr. Jones, I'm giving you a shout out because you make me feel like I'm worth, I'm worthy. Like she told me, she was like, I have a competitive spirit. And she was like, when I come to your class, I just feel safe. She said, I feel like I can actually do something. She said, I don't feel that in anybody else's classroom. And it really made me feel so emotional because I'm like, if I can do that for just one student, um, then I can do that for anybody. And it's just as simple things that we do in class you know, the activities we do. We don't sit and just read out a book. Like Mr. Brown said, data does not teach at all. Facts do not teach. But we as educators do. 
And it's about what we do with that data. It's about what we do with those facts. I can spit facts all day long. I can spit data all day long, but how can I create an atmosphere and an environment where it is open? We celebrate each other. I've had kids sit down and be like, look, I enjoyed this person because they did X, Y, and Z for me. That my kids come in on Fridays, they be like, Mr. Jones, we're going to celebrate. Let's give a shout out to the classroom. And they're virtual. Like they're not even in person dealing with each other. They're virtual. One girl said, hey, I'm giving a shout out to my whole class because y'all made me feel like I can handle virtual learning. That was crazy to me. I'm like, what? You know, because sometimes they don't talk. Sometimes my kids don't talk online. So it's small things like that. And especially in the middle of a pandemic, we may see so many negative things on the news. We may feel so much hatred or so much pain, but we, we can't forget to celebrate. We can't forget who we are. We can't forget where we come from. We cannot forget what we do. And for my students, I think it's very important that, again, once a week, every Friday, it is mandatory we celebrate. Because sometimes throughout the week, I tell my kids, y'all, I'm tired. I'm frustrated. You know, I, I'm drained. And they be like, Mr. Jones, we, we, feel, we feel the same way. And I tell them, look, since we all feel the same way, take a few minutes, you know, get out your bed, go get some water, go get something to eat, whatever you need to do to get your mind right. And that is the power that we all have, whether you're actually in education or you're not in education. We're all mentors in some shape, form, or fashion. We're all role models. People look up to all of us in some shape, form, or fashion. You have a little brother, little sister, cousin, uncle, whoever, right? But we have to think about what are we doing and what are we saying that's going to make that difference? How are we, our voice has power, but when we stop using it or when we abuse it, it causes issues. And that's how I feel in education. A lot of times people will say something and they don't even realize that what you say affects everything around you. But if we take the time to celebrate, we take the time to really embrace what's going on. Yes, there's a lot of negativity going on, but let's not forget the positive stuff, right? Let's not forget the history that we all are making because that's what changes the game. And I hope that everyone here feels that, you know, when you leave here, be a different person, right? Don't just come and listen. Let's make a change. Let's make a difference because none of us can do this alone. I tell my kids that every day for a reason. I am never alone. I have people like Dr. Little. I have all my brothers here. They all support me. I can call Will right now, but look, Will, I'm, I'm struggling. Help me out, bro. You know, and that's the power that we have as adults, as kids, it does not matter. We should all be able to get on the phone right now and call somebody about, look, hey, I need your advice on something. Can you help me out with this? And once we get to that point, that is what creates a different dynamic. My kids look at each other as family. It's not just a classroom, it's family. We're gonna fuss, we're gonna fight, we're gonna argue, you're gonna do all that. That's what family do. But at the same time, we challenge, we motivate, we encourage each other. And we gonna, again, we're gonna celebrate. And that, that's all I got. Thank you, Mr. Jones, uh, dropping the mic once again. Um, and, you know, I think that's one thing that you said that is really important. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get on my soapbox because that's a whole other thing. But, you know, we as educators, whether you're a K-12 teacher, professor, uh, administrator, we have so much power in the words that we say. Uh, and I'll never forget going to a, a school, a high school one day uh, to talk about Call Me Mr. And I'm, I'm sharing the information with some some young men to be a part of uh, what we call the Rising Mr. Academy. And as soon as they walk away from my table, one of the teachers walks up to them and says, you don't wanna do that. And she was referring to teaching. Like, this is a teacher, right? <laughs> like this, these are the examples uh, that, that these kids are, are supposed to be following. So if you're one of those black males and you experience that, are you gonna wanna be a teacher? <laughs> probably not, probably not. Uh, and, and, that's, and that's one of the, the lighter stories that we have when it comes to those type of things and so we always have to be mindful at all times of the of the type of things that we are imparting to these young people so i appreciate that um speaking of that um one of the things i wanted to make sure we ask because it's already 5 56 and we want to get to the q a in a few minutes uh well, like, like i said we will have a part two we're gonna have to all right um but i did want to know just what is the biggest thing that call me mister has given you as an educator Hear me? 
You're very low. I'm, I'm, most people are shaking their heads no, Will. So you, you still may have to do the chat. Um, can anybody else respond verbally while Will's putting something in the chat? Um, I'll go. Um, so I've been a part of Call Me Mr. for a while. Um, and I was one of the first. Um, I was part of the first cohort of Call Me Mr. at Georgia College. Um, and for me, it... I think what sticks out to me the most, and Dr. Little, I gotta tell this story real quick and it's gonna make it short and simple. But Dr. Little came to my high school and we talked for hours. And when I went into my interview for Call Me Mister, he asked a very important question. And that question, even to this day, years later, still sticks with me. And it is the reason why I do what I do. And um, since I'm talking about shout out, shout out to you, Dr. Little, for this question. Dr. Little asked me, if you were a tree, what part of the tree would you be and why? Now, I'm in high school. I didn't know nothing about me being no tree. No, okay, I don't know. Like, I sat there. I was like, what kind of question is this? And to this day, I still know my answer and I stand by my answer. I told Dr. Little, I want to be the roots of the tree. And I want to be the roots of the tree because the roots are what build the tree. That's what gives that nutrients. That's what provides everything for the tree. With no roots, nothing can stand for the tree. And I still feel that way to this day. Nothing has changed. I am still the roots of the tree because I am making change. I am changing. And I finally got to the point where I could acknowledge who I am and what I can do. Because at one point, I used to doubt myself all the time. I used to tell Dr. Little, look, I can't do that. <laughs> like, let's be real. I can't do that. But... I'm at the point now where it's not that I can't do something, it's that I was scared to do. And again, going back to the poem I read to my kids every day, our deepest fear. Again, my fear was that I just could not do it. But it's not, again, it's just not that I can't do it. I'm the roots to the tree. I'm providing for everything, but no one sees it. And that's the cool part about it. What I provide for my students, you don't have to see it because my students are the product of it. You're gonna see what my students can do, not what I do, because it's not about me at this point. It's about what my students do. When my principals come into my classrooms, they see my students, they don't see me. And I tell my administration all the time, even though I'm a first year teacher, I tell them, look, when y'all come to my class, I'm gonna be honest, don't look at me, because I ain't got good sense, so don't look at me. But I want y'all to see what my kids can do. Watch them work, watch them communicate, because it's about them. They are my trees. I'm the roots for them to succeed. So that that's that's it for me. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Yeah, that, that's a question that it all it, it throws off everybody. Everybody. Uh, but it's a really good one in the context of what we try to do with Call Me Mr. So I did want to mention Mr. Cooper put in the chat since his audio's uh, messing up a bit. He said in 2018 he was able to experience, hold on. In 2018, I was able to experience my first Call Me Mr. Summer internship at Clemson University. The summer internship allowed me to serve as teacher assistant. It changed my life. I learned so much that summer. Thank you, Mr. Mark Joseph, for making that possible. So, Mr. Joseph, I see you in the chat. I appreciate you. Uh, Will, Will was talking about that internship for, for the entire year after that. Um, and so for those of y'all who aren't familiar, um, misters, especially the ones in South Carolina, they have the opportunity to participate in a summer internship where they learn a lot of things about teacher efficacy and brotherhood and really get enmeshed within the culture of Call Me Mister straight at the source, right there at the headquarters. And so uh, that was a really impactful um, experience for him. And I believe, I'm not entirely sure, but you might've been the first one from outside of South Carolina to participate in that. Uh, definitely the first one from Georgia. So that's really awesome. And, and thank you, Mr. Cooper, for, for adding that. You know, one more mister to, to tell everyone like what was maybe the biggest thing about this call me mister experience that has helped shape you as a person the biggest thing um uh, that has um helped shape this experience for me from call me mister has definitely been the rising mister academy um that i've had the privilege of being the coordinator for um for the past three years i would say i think three um more like five, but yeah, okay. Uh, five, five, actually, yeah, five. So yes, yeah, so that's a that's an account. We haven't been able to do it recently because of um, COVID nineteen, um, the pandemic. But 
that's this is a um, program where we have high school kids come to Georgia College um, and we teach them basically what it means to be a teacher. Um, so we have several black males, not not and not just black males, males of um, all ethnicity, all ethnicity, all ethnicities. Why can I say that word? Ethnicities. Jesus Christ, I don't know why I can't. I I'm at ethnicity. the ethnicity. I got you. I got you. Word. <laughs> why? Uh, <laughs> we have all males come to Georgia College um, to to basically learn how to be teachers, and we teach them how to make lesson plans. We teach them what, what it actually means to be a teacher. We have um, several vice principals and um, leaders in education come and teach them what, what it means to do their positions in education. Um, and then at the end of that, um, at the end of that week, they're there on campus for a week. They teach a lesson. And recently we had them teach it to um, an after school program or a summer program, a summer camp. Um, of middle school and elementary school students. Um, so they taught their lesson to younger students. There was a group of high school students and they, they taught their lesson to middle school and elementary school students. And just seeing their growth from the start of the week to the end of the week when they're actually behaving like teachers and um, presenting their lessons for these, for these students that they worked very hard on um, throughout the week, it's just, it was just, it was, it's really good to see progress, um, the progress of those, those kids. So I really enjoy that part of Call Me Mr. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Um, and efforts like the Rising Mr. Academy, uh, hopefully they're being duplicated in, in other areas because it's out of necessity. When we talk about this whole issue of where are the black male teachers and teacher diversity, one of the things that you realize is you, you've got to do a lot, we have to do a much better job of building a pipeline early on. And so what I, one of the things that I'm kind of speaking into existence from later on is that we, we build in a middle school component to that because often by the time a young man gets to be 16, 17 years old, he's already X'd off teaching as a possibility. And uh, so we, we've got to reach young men a bit much earlier when it comes to that. So, Mr. Jones, I really appreciate that. And yet it's definitely something that we enjoy and it's, and it's beneficial for us. It's beneficial for the students, even if they decide not to teach. A lot of it's about college prep as well. So that's that's equally important there. Um, really quickly. So um, what is one thing that any of you wished K-12 or college administrators knew when it came to increasing teacher diversity and why? Um, for me. I think it's very important um, that in college we learn, we talk about diversity, but we don't apply it. Um, and I say that because we could talk about diversity all day long and what it means, but if we're not celebrating or if we're not acknowledging the struggles or the situations that different people go through and learning how to manage them and learning how to embrace them inside the classroom, then diversity means nothing. Um, so I think for me, the biggest part is not, don't just throw diversity up as a word to make yourself feel good. When we talk about diversity and when we talk about teaching, let's remember that everyone, it does not matter what your career is, it does not matter where you come from, everyone is an educator, just like everyone is a learner. All of us have at some point learned something from someone. Our parents most specifically, right? We learn from our parents and our parents taught us. So it's not just the educators that have to do the work, but the community, everyone has to pitch in and do the work. Um, and I think in college, that, that's one thing I wish <laughs> um, that I had more of was understanding experiences that are not my own so that I can learn how to empathize. I don't want to sympathize with nobody, right? But I want to empathize and do my best to try and understand what each person go through so that I can better myself and I can reach out to more people. So, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Jones. One more, Mr., really briefly, and we'll, we'll get to the last question before Q&A. One thing you okay. with K-12 or college administrators would know. Go ahead. 
Well, one thing that I wish that K through 12 and college administrators would know is that you must be willing to go to those environments where the, where the population is that you're trying to recruit. Um, I feel that a lot of times, you know, you have a lot of institutions and a lot of K through 12 schools um, who say, well, we want more African-American males or more African-Americans, period, but they're not willing to go through the necessary steps that it takes to make that happen, um, which, which ultimately shows that they're just giving up service. Um, I, I think that if there's not an actual plan of attack or an actual plan to make these things go about happening, well then, you know, using these words like diversity and saying how we care about diversity, you know, I think that talk can just be saved. Um, I, I think you really have to go about actually taking the necessary steps to make these things happen. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Um, and I think this is really important in this moment, right? Um, with all the, the, the protests, you know, after George Floyd's murder um, and, you know, all the companies and organizations putting out their, their nice little neat Black Lives Matter statements. And then months later, it's like, oh, okay. So that was just lip service, right? <laughs> and so it's really important to actually put action behind these words um, and, you know, Every, every, when I go to different schools and districts and talk about calling Mr. and teacher diversity, lots of people agree with the concept, but it's different when you actually have to implement it, right? When you actually have to do the work, when you have to do the self-reflection, because it's one thing to, to bring students, underrepresented students to a, a particular setting. It's a whole other thing to actually have the mechanisms and structure to support them. And that's when you talk about programs like Call Me Mr., that's the crux of everything. That's what makes things work is that you have to have an environment that allows people to thrive, not only survive as well. So I appreciate that. Last question before we get to this Q and A, cause I know some people are starting to jump off and they've got to go. Um, and just answer this really quickly. I just want a couple of y'all to answer. What would you tell a 13 year old boy about the possibility of becoming a teacher? What would you tell a 13 year old boy about the possibility of becoming a teacher? Um, could I speak up? Who is that? Who is that? Uh, Derek Daniels. Yeah, Derek, can you save your answer just for a couple of minutes? Hold on to it though. Hold on to it because I think it is important to get your answer too. I want I want to hear from the misters here really quickly. Okay. Okay. Yeah, my bad. I was confused about. Okay, that. that's all right. What's up? Can I go? Okay. So, something that I would tell a thirteen-year-old young man who wants to go into teaching is, this is not a career that you choose um, just for the money. Um, this is not a career that you choose because someone else wants you to do it. This is a career that you choose because you're passionate about it and because you really want to make a difference. Um, and if teaching is not in their heart and teaching is not something they really have a love and passion for, I would tell them don't do it. Um, because I think that a lot of teachers get into this for the wrong reasons. Um, and, and I think they find out that the, that when it's too late that this isn't what they're really passionate about. Um, if you really want to make a difference and if your teaching is really something that you're passionate about, well, then I would tell that 13 year old to push forward and I would show him the necessary way and path uh, to make that happen. Um, but I also want to make sure that this is something that that child truly has uh, a passion for. Um, because I, I think that first off, there has to be the passion to teach um, and, and to help uh, steer and lead the next generation in the, in the right path. Uh, because without that, I think that it, it, it never um, as well, typically. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Maybe one more mister before we jump to the Q&A. There's one thing you would tell a 13 year old boy about the possibility of becoming a teacher. And I can share what I say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, um, I, I think one of the biggest things is that number one, to Mr. Davis's point, um, you can't mislead kids. Uh, you, you can't simply talk about, oh, you have summers off. Oh, you know, you, and you, that's not what teaching is. If you're getting into teaching for that, this, this ain't the job for you. And so you have to be honest about, you know, what it's going to look like. And, and also be, on, be honest about, look, there's never going to be a job anywhere in the world where you have a chance literally to make an impact on, on somebody not only on somebody, but the next generation, every single day. Um, everybody talks about wanting to change the world, but teachers have that opportunity literally every single day. Now it's up to that teacher to actually take advantage of that. But when you are that type of teacher that we talk about in Mister, you not only affect individuals, you affect entire generations. Um, as, as Mr. Winston Holton put in the forward for the Call Me Mister book here, 
Um, he, he talks about misters being architects. They build villages. Like that's real. That is real. And so that's something that I would share with the 13 year old. And so, um, Look, it's 612 already, y'all. <laughs> we definitely gonna have to do a part two, but um, I do want to allow for some questions. So if you could, I know some, some people have already put some questions in the chat. So if you have some questions for our guys, go ahead and put those questions in the chat. I can't get to every single one of them, but we're gonna try and get to as many as we can over the next few minutes, okay? Um, just kind of looking here, let's see. That little, it's been a lot of questions um, yes, yes. from the beginning yes. um, in the chat. Um, so I know we're not gonna be able to get to them, but, um, I've wrote down as many as I could, um, just to at least address it, or maybe we can email whoever wrote the question down and try to get an answer out to them. Yeah. Can, can you read one of the ones that you wrote down? Cause I'm still scrolling up here. Um, one was about, um, are there any misters working on national teaching certification? Um, is there an opportunity to launch the Rising Mister Academy um, very similar to Khan Academy? Like, is there a way for us to launch that out? Um, and then there's a couple more yeah, questions, I, but I can, I can uh, start there. Yeah, I can I can address that that question really briefly. Uh, now, and I, I and I also meant to say that I want any pro. I mean, I know a lot of people have questions about like how Call Me Mister works and the programmatic stuff. Uh, I want to be able to answer that in, in the best way possible. So. I want y'all to try to hold those questions and maybe email me later because maybe we can set up maybe a separate presentation to talk about the ins and outs of Call Me Mister. But to answer that particular question, yeah, the Rising Mister Academy is something that we that we began in 2015 kind of out of necessity, uh, but it's definitely something that can be duplicated elsewhere. Um, of course, you, if you don't have a Call Me Mister program, you can't call it that, but those type of efforts are not necessarily unique to Georgia College. And so um, for that person who asked that question, I encourage you to email me. Let's, let's talk a bit more about that uh, because there are similar efforts going on around the country. Uh, part of the reason why we formed the Rising Mr. Academy is from observing some of those other efforts because we realize you can't just rely on recruiting high school seniors. I think particularly for an institution like ours where just like black men only account for 2% of the teaching population, you only account for 2% of our actual student body at George College. You see what I'm saying? So you have to do, do things you've never done in order to get students you haven't gotten. And so Thaddeus, I know you had a question about how to become a part of Call Me Mister. You know, I, I'll answer that very briefly. Number one, you have to apply to the institution that has that Call Me Mister program. That sounds obvious, but <laughs> it is a very important step that sometimes some people miss, all right? Um, so talk, getting on admissions radar, and, and we do have Mark, Mr. Marcus Kyles, uh, one of our admissions people here on the chat. I noticed that he's been putting some information in the chat as well. So getting in contact with our admissions people and getting on our radar. And then number two, Call Me Mr. does have a separate application process. And so all that information is at the Georgia College Call Me Mr. website. It's an online application. Then once you fill that out, there's an essay that you have to complete, as well as send in two letters of recommendation um, and send in a resume. And then the last portion of that is what Mr. Jones alluded to a few minutes ago about the interview process, uh, talking with myself, possibly some other misters, possibly members of our advisory board about your desire to teach, about your capacity to become a mister. Uh, and so, you know, there, there's a whole lot of other things that, that go into like from point A to point Z, <laughs> but that's kind of the elevator speech version of that. But I'd be happy to talk with you more about that in detail a bit later as well, okay? Let's see. So Kathleen Amon says, if GCSU, KSU, and Clemson have Call Me Mr. programs, which HBCUs have one? Places where there are more than 2% of African-American male students. <laughs> That's a great question. So um, actually, if you go on the Call Me Mr. website, they have a list of all the Call Me Mr. institutions, both the, um, the South Carolina institutions as part of that collaboration, and then, and then they also have a separate tab for the national partner institutions. And I think that's an important question because there's a large amount of diversity within Call Me Mr. School. So you do have some, several even, that are HBCUs, but you also have some that are on the on a end of the spectrum like Georgia College, where we're predominantly white institutions. So you don't, there's not a prerequisite for you to be a quote unquote black school for you to have a program like this. Um, 
it's funny because once we got they call me mr program everyone was very surprised because they knew about our demographics and they're like y'all gotta call me mr program okay yeah <laughs> so the the main thing is having the institutional capacity to support it and having the willingness to really support the students that are in the program once they get there and thank you uh marcus for for posting that information marcus is our coordinator of diversity recruitment uh, and, you know, he is in collaboration with us when it comes to trying to build a program like this and, and just on a larger level to increase the diversity at our institution. And so he's generously posted his contact information. So for those of y'all who know any potential misters, contact me, but also please contact Marcus as well. So thank you, Marcus, for that. Let me see. I'm still scrolling. You're welcome, Emmanuel. Um, just want to say real quick um, from the you know, aspect of thinking about overall, like just our community. Um, I'm really just excited about the opportunity for all of, you know, these young men that I've been able to connect with over the past year of being here. Um, Will, like seeing you and seeing what you're doing, man, I've just been blown away by it. So um, super kudos to you. And I would say from an individual coming from, from Chicago, um, wasn't a, I was like there were men around who who called themselves teacher, but I didn't always have one who could be more intentional for me. And to see you guys doing that makes me become more emotional because um, I'm excited about the grounds that you guys plan for other young men to to follow in your footsteps. So super kudos for you. But I say this goes off for even for Clemson and what they've done there and KSU. Um, I wanted to be in a place where we can all see these young men. Um, and young women come to the place where they can turn around and make that impact in their community. So that's my, just my piece I want to say with it. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, I really appreciate that and, and your eager collaboration as, and good luck also with the uh, diversity preview day that admissions has going on on Saturday as well. Uh, I do want to address, let's see, at least one more question. Um, so this is also from Kathleen. She says, how do you retain African-American male teachers in the classroom when A, there are so few and B, those that we do have are being groomed for administrative positions, thus leaving the classroom. Uh, that's a question that I, I'm not sure I can answer completely, um, but I think that's important because one of the things that I share with our misters is, you know, as you're kind of looking at the statistics and the demographics, and I'm sure a lot of our K-12 administrators can, can support this because they see it every day, even though black men are so severely underrepresented in the classroom, it seems that once you get there, there's kind of a more or less a fast track to administration. Um, and so, you know, we can, we can talk at a different juncture about exactly why that is. Um, but I think that is an important dynamic to mention when you're talking about this, because you do have some teachers that are amazing at their job that may not necessarily want to go into administration, right? Uh, that are nonetheless being groomed for it because it could be maybe that assumption because you're a male that you want to be in leadership um, you know, those type of patriarchal assumptions may come up, but uh, I think it is important to be honest with any young man that wants to be a teacher. And we, we talk about this a lot in Mr. about, look, if you want to be a principal, if you want to be a superintendent, that path is there for you, but make sure that's something that you want to do. And number two, if you go on that path, make sure that you don't close the door behind you. Make sure that you're leaving it open for other people. Like, those of y'all who've received my emails, you've probably seen my signature, that Toni Morrison quote, right, about um, your job is to free someone after you. And, and I think as somebody that is aspiring for administration, you have to take on that particular attitude. And so I'm happy to see so many administrators on this call, people like Mr. Ray from Oak Hill that really exemplify that, like that is extremely important. And so, Kathleen, I'm not sure if I completely answered that question. That's probably an answer that'll have to uh, go on and on, um, but I, I think it's something that is very important to mention here. Now, in the interest of time, I did want to leave a couple of minutes because we have a lot of programs represented here. And so I, I wanted to just leave just maybe five minutes or so total for any of these organizations to, to briefly tell us about who you are, what you do, because I know just based off of a glance, there are several organizations here that are that can be great resources for the educators that are available on here. So I wanted to yield the floor. We've got people from the Black Male Educators Talk, BME's Talk. We've got folks from Clark Atlanta, the, the illustrious Dr. Felicia Mayfield as well. So um, I guess I, I wanna start with um, Ayodele Harris from BME's Talk. Uh, he, he messaged me earlier. So I wanna give you the floor.
to talk about what you have going on with that. And then I want to allow my folks at Clark to, to speak a bit about what they have going on as well, if that's okay. Thank you. This is the first time I can say it publicly like this in the space, Dr. Little. Like I've always put it on something, but I just want to congratulate you um, on that. We've been talking about it. This, this is for everybody else in the room. Now I, I can say Dr. Little in front of that. Um, hi, I'm Ayodele Harrison. I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I've been teaching and leading in public private international schools for um, over 20 years. 16 years into teaching, I was actually pushed out of the classroom because my desire to become a teacher leader the way that I wanted to be was not nurtured, right? The direction of my school was putting me in one place, but you know, the typical path is dean of students, so on and so forth, dean of culture, and sometimes that's where you get stuck. That's not where I wanted to be in that space. I wanted to be a teacher leader. And so what I did was leave and, and open up a consulting firm. And so what I want to let you all know is that what I do is focus on black male educator leadership development from where they stand. This is not a principal track. What it is is about saying, how do we actually facilitate equity centered learning experiences for our students, for our families, for our colleagues and our communities. And so in the chat, I'm just gonna put my information there. The leadership lab that we have is gonna be a virtual uh, lab the 24th. My email is there. Option one, if you are a black male educator, especially a mister on this call, I want to ensure that you are in this leadership lab. So what I want you to do is take a look at the link, make sure it's something you can commit to, email me and say, I want a complimentary free ticket. For all those other administrators and senior black male educators on the call, you are here to support black male educators and their development. I am a black male educator. My team of black male educators, mentors and guides, lead, uh, black males become leaders. I'm expecting you to email me saying, I want a sponsor to black male educators to attend. They could be specifically black male educators from the Call Me Mr. program or just in your district. I want you to reach out and say, hey, I'm now putting skin in the game, not just clicking and keeping my video off on this call, but saying, hey, I want black male educators to be in a space where they're going to learn what 100 other Atlanta and also Georgia based educators. I'm based here in Atlanta, Georgia right now. That's how I know um, Dr. Little. So all that information is there. Thank you so much for giving me a chance to speak. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Mr. Harrison, for that. I, I, I got a chance to probably contact him for the first time several years ago when we were doing a bit of research for Call Me Mister, and I, and I saw the things that they are doing. And one of the things that you realize about doing this work is that you're only gonna go so far if you're not collaborating. And so you have to have a collaborative spirit in order to really support these students in the best that you can. So I appreciate that. Um, speaking of which, Dr. Mayfield, I wanted to give you a minute or so to talk about what you have going on over there at Clark. Uh, Dr. Little, first of all, I have to salute you and uh, give my deepest appreciation to you and your leadership. Uh, leadership means so much and I just wanna thank you for the example you have set. Uh, really around the state, you're doing a magnificent job and, and I appreciate that. Um, I need to acknowledge, um, uh, I am the PI for the grant males of color in the teacher pipeline at Clark Atlanta University. But my grant boss is on the, is on the call, Dr. Mons, and I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Kathleena Mons and Joy Jones from Albany State University Center for Educational Opportunity. Uh, it's going to take money and focused money on focused objectives to get us where we need to provide the appropriate mentoring and direction for uh, our students. I'd also like to announce that I think I have 16 out of 58 uh, participants on this call. So collaboration is key. And then the last thing I'd like to say is that if you are interested in social justice, the one single, if you had to do one single thing on this earth, that would disrupt the classroom to prison pipeline when a student has a male teacher of color in front of them, discipline is cut in half. Discipline is cut in half. In as much as the pipeline is connected to the high suspension rate and the disproportionality, we can disrupt this with strong males in our classroom. Though if we had to do one thing, one thing, that was significant to 
to uh, in terms of social justice, it would be to encourage males uh, of color as teachers, as you have done in your organization. Dr. James Young is, is a soldier in this fight and he is on the call as well. And Dr. Vincent Harris, another colleague, along with all the students that I gave a shout out in the chat. Thank you and I yield. Thank you so much, Dr. Mayfield. And again, see, this is another person who, who I met several, several years ago at a conference and we were talking about how can we collaborate? Um, and you know, she was able to invite some of our misters to participate in the chat earlier on, pretty early in the pandemic, I believe. And we, we talked about a lot of things that we mentioned today as well, and that's what it's going to take. So thank you for all that you do. Um, as you've seen in the chat, like her influence spreads everywhere. Like she, she, she's got it. So I appreciate you. Any other organizations represented that, that, that want to offer any opportunities before we close for the day? Hi, Dr. Little, this is Paquita Morgan from the Professional Standards Commission. And I, I don't want to belabor the time, but just to say that uh, this has been phenomenal listening in. You know, I'm a huge, huge fan and supporter. Um, I, I also support Georgia College and State. And it's uh, I've always been impressed with your leadership. And um, I, I just, uh, hats off to you and hats off to this forum. And I, I just encourage uh, the continued collaboration and what you are doing, uh, Dr. Little, is so instrumental um, and, in so, and so integral to, um, as Dr. Mayfield said, just really breaking, breaking some, down some of those barriers and, and the important work of equity um, and, and, and black males in the pipeline. So hats off to you and, and great to hear Dr. Mayfield always and, and great to be on this call tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paquita. Um, I, I, you see, Mr. has, we, we have so many connections. Um, that's somebody who's, who's with the Professional Standards Commission, y'all. Like that's a, that's a big deal. And so Paquita, I appreciate your support. Like you've always been a very enthusiastic supporter of Call Me Mr. So I appreciate you. Um, Kathleen Amans, you, you raised your hand, you got something? I did and thank you for Dr. Yep. Little for a fantastic workshop, I appreciate it. And thank you, Dr. Mayfield, for your engagement and involvement with the Center for Educational Opportunity. One of the things that we wanted to share with the team and based on what we heard this evening, we'd like to be involved in a way to provide research dollars and support for your Call Me Mr. students who are in the classroom, who have, who have articles, who have research that they want to curate, that they want to develop papers, white papers, um, and research studies that we really need to, to get into the marketplace because we know that their experiences are unique. And we also know that policymakers listen to research findings. It's one thing to say it's a warm, fuzzy demand, but it's another thing for them to manifest research that, that, that speaks volumes to their real experiences. And so our center would certainly love to get involved in a way that we provide research dollars for your, for your Mr. Students or, or students, African-American male students uh, abroad. I mean, in general, thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll definitely begin with you after this. Uh, so if you can send me an email, we can we can get that conversation going. And like when you when you mentioned that, it just reminded me of the fact that they didn't mention it in their intros, but several of these misters want to go on and get their PhD or EDD. <laughs> I don't know why they want to do that, but <laughs> they do. And um, I, and I, I've had a lot of conversations with them about the possibility of continuing their education. And you know. As, as uh, Mr. Harris said earlier, I finished my PhD journey a couple of years ago and I was very transparent with these misters throughout that time about the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, and uh, you know, out of the misters that we have, at least, at least half of the misters that we have in our, cohort, in our cohort, whether they're current or alumni, want to go on to get a PhD or EDD. Uh, and, and I think that's really awesome. And so to your point, I, I definitely think this is something that they, they might be able to take advantage of as, as budding researchers uh, and, and also for us as, as practitioners that are doing research-based practice around these types of things. And so I really appreciate that. Uh, and especially the note about us growing our own because that's what it's about. That's what it's about. If not us, then who, right? So I appreciate that. Um, any, any other 
questions or comments before we close. I appreciate y'all being with us a bit longer than what we intended. I figured this conversation was gonna last longer than an hour. <laughs> That's just how it goes, right? Um, but as I said, we will have to do a part two. We will have to. So we will keep y'all informed and posted about what that looks like. Um, doesn't look like anyone else has anything right now, but y'all do have my email. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, don't hesitate to follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, and we try to update y'all on the different things that we're doing. Uh, we'll be coming out with our newest newsletter at some point this spring that will include this as well. And really, let's let's give a, a virtual round of applause to all of our misters, please. Like, I'm really appreciative of these young men. Um, they're, they're really impressive. And honestly, like the stuff that y'all heard today that's, that doesn't even really scratch the surface. <laughs> That's why I feel just so privileged on that. Um, so thank you, thank you. Um, anything else? Doesn't look like it, all right. If all hearts and minds are clear, um, I really appreciate y'all. Look, be safe and we will be in contact with you. Thank you again for supporting our Call Me Mr. program. Uh, feel free to follow all of us on Instagram and, and Facebook and all of the things, right? and enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you once again.